So I think for me a very interesting slide that you know produces physical changes in the brain with adolescent exposure. Here's another study here. This one just came out maybe three months ago, four months ago. Some researchers at Northwestern University in Chicago looked at young adults, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, who used marijuana once per week. So these were not daily smokers or daily users, but you know, uh, they call them occasional users, once a week, not more than that. And so they compared the brains on um, magnetic resonance imaging, and so these were the brains of people who were exposed. These were the non-users here. So what do we see? This is the, um, oh, this relates to the question people, somebody had. So this is the nucleus accumbens here, the brain reward circuit much bigger here than in the non-users. See that? So um, nucleus accumbens much bigger in the users compared to the non-users. Um, now this structure right here is called the amygdala and actually this relates to what we've been talking about as well. The amygdala is very important for processing emotions and in adolescence, it's very much not yet developed. So you show um, adolescent boys a, um, a picture of a face that's of a woman who's terrified, and half of them will interpret it as her being um, angry, not scared. And so adolescents just don't process emotions the same way as adults because their amygdala here is not fully developed, and um, you can see in marijuana users, on average, if you average this and this, it's bigger, adds up to a bigger size than this here. So I think the bottom take home point is, is that this is not just one study now, we've had multiple studies showing that the brains of people who use marijuana are different than the brains of people who don't use marijuana. Why is that the case? Uh, is it because the brains were different to begin with or because marijuana made the brains different? We don't know yet. Okay, so we need more research, but we do know the brains are significantly different. That's an example of how. And uh, so maybe with that, uh, we're gonna have another um, question answer time. So. Hello everyone. This second Q&A session is designed for you all to have an opportunity to talk with each other and process some of the information that you've been listening to, share some of your opinions, your questions, your insights. The registration packet that you received when you arrived this morning has uh, three questions in there for uh, Gaia Dialogue. Uh, the first one says, what is one piece of information from this morning's presentation that was newest or most interesting to you? And the second two questions ask you your opinion on what's the most compelling way to present or translate this information to youth and then to parents and families. And so the idea that we have here is that you could use those questions to guide a conversation with your neighbor or a couple neighbors that you could uh, metaphorically grab the person next to you or a couple people who are seated next to you and uh, share some of your reactions to what you've heard so far this morning. I'm also aware that uh, people may need a refill on coffee, which we have in the commons area, as well as muffins and granola bars and some fruit. So if you can take about 10 minutes to chat with your neighbor, uh, take care of your sustenance needs, and then reconvene, and I do want to also um, squeeze in a few more minutes of Q&A using the note cards that we received so far this morning. So that's what we are off to do. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Here's the next question. What is considered heavy use and what is the difference between girls and boys in brain development and use? Yes, okay. So what is considered heavy use? What's the difference between boys and girls in terms of marijuana use? And um, so heavy use is defined as, let me get back to some of the studies here. This study looked at using once per week and they found brain differences. Um, 
If we go back to the, for example, the um, Dunedin study, where heavy use of marijuana conferred um, up to an eight-point drop in IQ, that was defined two ways. One, either having cannabis dependence, so as de defined by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual Mental Disorders, fourth edition, um, cannabis dependence, um, or using four or more days out of the week. So using the majority of days. That was the um, definition for heavy use in that study. Um, in the pregnancy um, uh, literature, it was using at least one joint per day during first trimester. Yes or no was the cutoff there. So hopefully that answers that question. In terms of boys and girls and brain development, right, so as I mentioned, boys are twice as likely to use marijuana um, twice as likely to, and then not just use it, but also have a cannabis use disorder. And um, it's not clear exactly why that's the case. That is the case for most substances, um, more males than females, males more vulnerable. Um, part of that may have to do with males being, um, their brain develops more slowly. That's um, very true, and so it's all the more less protected they are in terms of their prefrontal cortex guarding their brain reward circuit. So I think that's, there's some biology there. And then probably some sociology there as well in terms of possibly more acceptable for boys to get drunk or use substances than girls. So those are the hypotheses that are out there now. Um, stay tuned, we need more information. It's a hot topic of research for how to um, differentially, uh, um, why it affects males, females differently. I will say, um, anecdotally, it seems like um, girls frequently come to treatment with more depression um, issues um, compared to boys. Um, so they also, I think the point there is that they present differently too, and there needs to be more research in terms of how treatment differs by gender as well. So. Um, hopefully that answers that. You've already spoken a bit about dabbing and waxing. If there's anything you want to add to this topic, the question is, what are the dangers associated with dabbing and or wax? And is it more severe than when one uses regular marijuana? Right. So the dangers of dabbing, obviously you have the uh, blowtorch. And I mentioned there's more. <laughs> and it's somebody who's intoxicated. and so there's more risk. We've seen more fires, significantly more fires in the Denver area related to this um, than before. That's increasing. I think also the risk for addiction is greater. We don't have hard and fast data on that yet. Um, we have some, I'm gonna present it to you, but um, it appears that um, people who dab have more severe addiction and it's hard. Severity of addiction is a poor prognostic indicator for overall treatment outcomes. Um, so I think that's something else to think about as well. And then um, just anecdotally also, my patients who dab say it's like a completely different, it's like another level of intoxication. So the intoxication is much more significant with that. Um, Oh, yes, thank you for giving me the chance to talk about this also. So butane hash oil, blowtorch, um, what's the impact of these various different chemicals um, on, especially on the developing adolescent brain? Um, we need to know more about that. Um, and there's reason to be concerned about the impact that those chemicals could have on the, on the brain. I think those are the things I have to say about that. Thank you. In this next question, we received several different note cards that asked pretty much the same question. Um, and this is about cause and effect. Perhaps kids with a tendency to anxiety or psychosis are more prone to use marijuana, which is cause and which is effect. Right. That's a great question. So in humans, like I said, will never have a definitive study. We can't do the randomized placebo-controlled trial, so there's always going to be a shadow of a doubt around that. I will say the findings I presented to you around, for example, increased rates of psychosis, increased rates of anxiety disorder, 
Those studies are longitude, well-designed longitudinal studies that did their best to control for other factors such as other substance use, baseline anxiety, um, socioeconomic status, school achievement, and so statistically there are things that they can do to try to control for those factors and the findings related to anxiety and psychosis hold up even after controlling for those things and it, con <coughs> it converges with the animal literature where we can say adolescent exposure to marijuana causes increased anxiety for example and so you're right we can't say adolescent exposure to marijuana causes psychosis and anxiety in humans but we can say there's a preponderance of evidence now that there's a strong association between the two especially as it comes to psychosis um, what else do I want to say about that so so you're right it's a it's a tricky question around that thank you so what we're going to do now is we have the last half hour of Dr. Thurstone's morning presentation. He also has an afternoon presentation. After this last segment, we will have yet another Q&A session. So I've still got a pile of note cards up here. We're going to try and get through them. And um, another thing I wanted to add is that that dialogue that you just had, those three questions about um, what's new, compelling information for you, how do we translate this for youth and parents and families, we do have two different sets of posters in the commons. Um, you may have noticed, it, noticed one set just to the right of the auditorium doors. As you walk out, there's another set over by the doors that exit to the road. And there are markers by those posters. And the idea is that during breaks and during lunch, you could jot down your responses to those questions so that we have yet another way to hear from each other and dialogue with each other as a regional community. So. Um, please take advantage of that when you're out in the commons later. And now the last half hour segment of Dr. Thurstone's morning presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for keeping us on target here. So how are we doing? Still awake? Um, it's a lot of science for one day. So uh, moving on here. I mentioned this already, and let me try to walk you through it. Uh, but the bottom line of this slide is that the extent of IQ loss with adolescent exposure to marijuana is at least on par with the IQ loss related to lead, pediatric lead exposure. And we took that, the pediatric lead exposure, we took very seriously. We got lead out of our gas, we got it out of our paint, we did pretty um, drastic things and were very successful in reducing pediatric lead exposure and so it begs the question what are we gonna how are we gonna respond to this as a community now pediatric marijuana exposure so here's the graph here this is the lot oh, oh sorry all right this is the loss of IQ here on this axis this is lead if you have a lead level as a child one to ten micrograms per deciliter of blood then there's a 7.4 point drop in IQ. If your lead level goes really high, between 10 and 30, you lose another 2.5 points. By the way, the average lead level in Chicago um, in the 1970s was like 15. I mean, it was unbelievable. Um, how any of us survived, really. Um, now I know what's the matter with me. Uh, so let's see here. Marijuana here, um, if you have in utero exposure to THC, there's a corresponding drop of up to five points. And um, marijuana exposure as a teenager, up to eight points. So potentially a 13 point drop here. Again, a standard deviation was about 15. So significant drop here. And then on par here with about a 10 point drop with lead. And the numbers are about the same, too, in terms of the number of lead exposures, pediatrics, and then the number of children born exposed to marijuana and children with heavy exposure to marijuana. So um, just uh, the, the slide is to put things in perspective and to you know, begin a conversation, and, which is why it's great we're here today. How are we going to 
um, try to protect youth. These are some studies that we've done here, um, well, done in Denver, and published in peer-reviewed studies. And they have more to do with some of the epidemiology now, so some of the statistics. And so let me walk you through this. This was uh, the first study we published, um, medical marijuana diversion and associated problems in adolescent substance treatment. So we collected these data in 2010, and we asked teens in substance treatment in Denver, have you ever um, gotten your marijuana from someone with a medical marijuana license? And at that time, we had 49% say yes. And then we compared those saying yes, those saying no, and those who were getting medical marijuana had more um, symptoms, more severe addiction to marijuana. And again, that goes back to the increased potency of these products, um, probably creating more severe addiction than um, the people not using these highly potent products. Now, uh, we replicated these studies, uh, this study in a larger sample, different kids in Denver, and also a year later. And at this point, 74% of teens in substance treatment said, yes, I'm using someone's medical marijuana. The average number of times they had used it was maybe once, twice. No, it was 50 times. So it wasn't just like a one-time thing, it was the average number of occurrences for accessing someone's medical marijuana was 50. Then we compared those using medical marijuana, those not using medical marijuana, and again, those using medical marijuana had more severe addiction to marijuana. So again, that's important because for many reasons, really, they're exposing themselves to more THC and the consequences we talked about, but also from a substance treatment standpoint, baseline severity of addiction is a poor prognostic indicator. Now, that was, one could say, well, those are teens in substance treatment. They're going to be using marijuana anyway, so we might as well give them high-grade marijuana that we've controlled for, and they don't have to go to a dealer for it. So we went to teens who were presenting to their pediatrician for a sports physical, a back-to-school physical. They had a cold, they had a sprained ankle, something like that. And we asked these teens, have you ever used medical marijuana, yes or no? Do you know someone with a medical marijuana card, yes or no? Um, in this sample here of teens in primary care, 18% said, yes, I use, I've used someone else's medical marijuana. Uh, about 36% said that they knew someone with a medical marijuana card. And uh, we compared those knowing someone versus those not knowing. Those who knew someone with a medical marijuana card, not surprisingly, reported easier access to marijuana, more favorable social norms about marijuana, um, and less perceived harmfulness of marijuana. So again, um, concerning that way. Now, this was a study that we uh, just published um, in July. So let me walk you through this here. Um, this is the uh, FARS data, fatality. Mm, I'm forgetting what FARS stands for again. Uh, it tracks traffic fatalities by um, substance use, basically. And so on the, um, this axis, the y-axis, we have the percent of traffic fatalities in Colorado is this line here on top. Percent of traffic fatalities in which the driver tested positive for marijuana on autopsy by urine, blood, however it was tested. And this dashed line on bottom is the percent of traffic fatalities in which the driver tested positive for marijuana in non-medical marijuana states. And so what we find here, this is from 1994 onward, and this is 2009. Why is 2009 important? That because that's when we had our major commercialization of marijuana in the state. We went from 5,000 medical marijuana patients to 120,000. We went from about zero medical marijuana centers to 700 at one point in our state. It really is, in my mind, when we had our de facto 
legalization of marijuana in the state where pretty much anybody could go and get a medical marijuana card if they wanted it. So that's why we use pre-post-2009 as an important time frame here. So uh, what do we see? We see a big spike, significant, statistically significant spike in traffic fatalities in Colorado um, in which the driver tested positive for marijuana pre-post-2009 that was not matched in non-medical marijuana states stayed flat in non-medical marijuana states, increased in Colorado. Now, a couple things about this. These are, these are important findings and very concerning. We need to do more research, however. Uh, we don't have information on the person's exact blood level at the time of the accident. Um, so we don't know the extent of acute impairment. Um, on that. Uh, so we need more research. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about driving as it relates to marijuana in a second here. Uh, so some people, I've heard it said, um, it's a good thing that people are driving under the influence of marijuana because then they won't be driving under the influence of alcohol, right? <laughs> and um, so this is kind of getting at that, not definitively, but kind of getting at that. Um, percent of traffic fatalities in which the person tested, po the driver tested positive for alcohol, yes or no. And this is by year 1994 to 2010 here. Um, and this is 2009. And Colorado stayed same, no significant difference. And non-medical marijuana states stayed the same as well. So alcohol seems to be staying flat, at least the recent past, past, but marijuana impaired driving significantly increasing. Now, you may have seen in the papers recently, um, the Washington Post had a story about how traffic fatalities in Colorado are, have gone down, which is great. Um, some people from the um, uh, marijuana industry have really promoted this as saying, see, marijuana legalization is good for traffic fatalities. Um, but there's significant, that's irresponsible to make that conclusion from those raw data. Um, when we know that cars are safer, people are using seat belts more often, there's more awareness around drunk driving, um, there are so many confounds to jump to that kind of conclusion. Um, OK. So um, these are some more data that we published in July. And so let me walk you through this. This is um, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And uh, we tracked in Colorado the proportion of adolescents who said, yes, there's great harm with using marijuana one to two times per week. Um, oh, sorry, um, 12 to 17 year olds. And so what we see in 2005-2006, 56% reported great harm with using one to two times per week. That's plummeted. By 2010-2011, it was 36%, a 20% drop. And I meant to mention also in the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, there was, while the actual change in use from um, 2011 to 2013 was not statistically significant, there was a statistically significant drop, I was told, in perception of harm. So again, the, it looks like the perception of harm is plummeting. In prevention, you know that that will predict an increase in actual use by about, precedes an increase in use by about a year or two. So stay tuned with that, some concerning developments. Uh, so in the same study here that we published, we looked at um, Colorado versus non-medical marijuana states. And so this is Colorado, this column. This is non-medical marijuana states here. Past year use among 12 to 17 year olds. Um, this is National Survey on Drug Use and Health. 20% for Colorado, 13% for non-medical marijuana states. Signific that's statistically significant difference. 
past year use among 18 to 24 year olds, 43% versus 29%, that's statistically significant. Past year use 25 and over, statistically significant. So in many cases, Colorado really is almost double um, what in terms of prevalence of use uh, compared to non-medical marijuana states. Um, then again, we have Colorado here in this column, non-medical marijuana states in this column here, and then the, we have the p-value. What's the p-value? It tells us if the, ch if the difference is within the margin of error or not. So 20-day use among 12 to 17-year-olds, that's a typical measure of daily use, using 20 or more days a month. Um, so if no significant difference between these groups here, but daily use among 18 to 24 year olds significantly greater in Colorado compared to non-medical marijuana states. Daily use of marijuana among 25 and overs significantly different here. I think for the prevention people um, and treatment people, well A, we have more, peop more heavy users now in this age group, young adult. And these are, we're getting into um, childbearing age here, right? And so again, back to the pregnancy, we really need to get that message out there around not using during pregnancy. Cannabis use disorder in Colorado here compared to non-medical marijuana states. Significantly more teens with cannabis use disorder in Colorado compared to non-medical marijuana states, which I think is really interesting. Look at this. So no difference really in terms of daily use, right? But we have more people with cannabis use disorder. What could be a possible explanation for that? Higher potency, exactly. Um, the potency of marijuana in Colorado I believe is you know, significantly greater than the United States as a whole. The University of Mississippi publishes the um, THC content of marijuana that's been confiscated. It's about 11% THC. We know in Colorado, as I mentioned, 20s is normal, and then butane hash oil, 90 plus percent, so much higher potency here in Colorado. Um, Past month prevalence of marijuana use in 12 and overs. Blue is United States, red is Denver. I put Denver here because it really is the epicenter of marijuana commercialization and legalization. Um, you see significantly higher in Denver, and whereas this is by year, 04, 06, 06, 08, 08, 10, National Survey on Drug Use and Health, Statistically significant increases in Denver, while the United States as a whole has stayed relatively flatline there. Past month prevalence of um, among 12 to 17 year olds in Colorado. This is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which tracks all kids, not just kids in school. Okay, we already talked why that's important. Um, and this is a significant difference here, going from 7.4 to 10.7 over the course of five years. That's a statistically significant difference. And I think that's something we need to look at. So for example, the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, I talked about some of the limitations of that. But looking year to year as if something magical happens the day uh, Amendment 64 was voted in, scientifically doesn't make sense. You really have to look at something over time to study the, uh, how uh, implementation of the actual system um, makes changes or co is correlated with changes or not. So if we look longitudinally like this, um, we're seeing significantly increases in um, past month marijuana use among 12 to 17 year olds in the state as a whole. The United States is blue, staying relatively flat line. Colorado as a whole uh, seems to be increasing. Uh, cities where marijuana is commercialized um, have higher rates of adolescent marijuana use. So this is um, the Healthy Kids Colorado. So I think it's interesting to look at it, slice it geographically as well. 
the state as a whole, at least in 2011, was 22 percent. Um, now it's down to now it's 20 percent. Denver, 28 percent, stayed the same in 2013. Boulder, 26 percent, and then the Southwest Colorado, the numbers I was able to get, 26 and a half percent. So if you just look at it like that, um, it at least appears uh, cities where it's commercialized uh, have higher rates of use. We know the Surgeon General um, report on tobacco smoking in 2010. The Surgeon General made no bones about it. They came out and said, um, marketing of tobacco causes youth initiation to smoke. I mean, that's strong language. Use that causal, that cause word in, in science is very strong. And um, so if we extrapolate a little bit um, to marijuana, alcohol, you know, we have pretty good data with other substances that it's the extent of commercialization is uh, really has a profound impact on youth. And it appears that so far with marijuana, that may be consistent. Number of drug-related school suspensions, expulsions. This is uh, Colorado Department of Education here. And again, 2009 was our big year, right? Um, a lot of things changed then. And so we saw a 40% increase in one year. We were hoping it was an anomaly. It stayed steady since then, despite pressure not to suspend and expel these kids, um, but still stays relatively high. <clears throat> These are data here that we presented at the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in the fall of 2013. Let me just walk you through it here. Every time somebody comes to substance treatment in our clinic, they have a urine drug screen. And it um, doesn't just say yes, no, they've been using marijuana, but we get an actual level, THC to creatinine ratio. And we noticed that the clinicians and I had noticed, wow, a high level used to be like, 400. Now we're, th <clears throat> now we're seeing 2,000s regularly. And so our, our, is our mind just playing tricks on us or is this real? And so sure enough, it was real. We compared the urine drug screen level of, um, this is 560 youth. Uh, and it used to be 360 before 2009, post-2009, 478. So statistically significant increase. Again, um, baseline addiction severity um, correlates with poor treatment outcomes, and we had noticed our outcomes weren't as good as they used to be as well. Um, and again, it's more potent products. So I've heard people say it's a good thing people are using more potent marijuana because they're smoking less and they're um, exposing themselves to less smoke. And so these data are not consistent with that. These data would suggest that people are using more potent products and then exposing themselves to more. They're not just self-titrating to the same level of intoxication or exposure with the more potent product. They're titrating up to a higher level of intoxication and exposure. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's why another reason why I think these data are important. <coughs> All right, so adult, adults are important too in this whole uh, issue. You know, marijuana is not great for adults either. Um, it's not like we want to go out and promote marijuana use for all adults here in Durango either. That's, that wouldn't be, from a public health standpoint, not a great thing. And uh, here, here's why. So overall, one in nine people who try marijuana develops an addiction. If you start after the age of 18, it's about one in 11. We already talked about that's, that's real addiction. Chronic marijuana use um, causes cognitive impairment for up to one month. So the story behind that is um, daily marijuana use among adults has not just acute impairment, acute intoxication, but what's called subacute impairment that lasts days to weeks. So adults who use daily display deficits in memory for up to one month after stopping their use. 
So that's something uh, that's unique to marijuana in many ways. So people can get drunk tonight, be relatively okay tomorrow. Um, with marijuana, the sub there's the subacute impairment. In this case, memory. Chronic marijuana use um, causes psychomotor impairment for up to three weeks. And that's a nice study coming from the National Institutes of Health showing that, again, daily adult marijuana users who stop using marijuana still have